The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lori Clark. I'm your moderator for today's webinar. And we're just a few minutes before 4 o'clock, so thank you for dialing in. We'll wait just a few moments for others to join us, and we'll get started uh, promptly in about a minute. Well, good afternoon once again, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Frameworks for Universal Assessment, External Recommendations and Vocabulary for the Assessment Process. My name is Lori Clark, and I'll be your moderator today. And uh, we are joined by our expert panelists, whom I will introduce to you in a moment. Um, they have uh, joined us today to walk us through this important topic of interest to the Home and Community-Based Services Universal Assessment Stakeholder Work Group. So we are joined today by the 35 or so members of the Stakeholder Work Group and also by approximately 275 members of the public who have registered for this call. So any for anyone who is not um, familiar with the Home and Community-Based Services Stakeholders Group. I just wanted to tell you very briefly that this is a work group that engages stakeholders in order to inform the California Department of Social Services, Department of Health Care Services, and California Department of Aging in the development of a universal assessment process that will include the development of a universal assessment tool. This work group effort is guided by um, SC 1036, and it really gives guidance for the, the quality of process and tool that needs to be um, developed together. And the purpose behind it is essentially to facilitate increased coordination, to help with data sharing, and improve care planning, all to the end of improving customer quality of care. So we're very excited about the work group. We have had one launch meeting, and now this webinar is a way of um, supporting the ongoing process to really help us to focus on key issues and concepts that will be important to our work. So again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. A few housekeeping notes as we begin today. Um, Technology being what it is, inevitably it may happen that someone may become disconnected from the webinar. If that happens, um, log out and log back in using the same link that you were provided. If you're not reconnected or if you have a technical question, then you are welcome to send a note to um, the CBSS website for the work group. We are monitoring that during the call, so we will be able to respond to you and provide technical assistance. So let me say the website um, address for those of you that would like to have it. Um, it's the same one that uh, you probably use to get the materials. It's cci.uat at dss.ca.gov. So one more time, cci.uat at dss.ca.gov. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce 
introduce to you Dr. Deborah Saliva and Dr. Lasa Ray. Hello. Um, this is Dr. Deborah Saliba. Um, the SO Lori's welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar. For the rest of the day, we're going to be talking about frameworks for universal assessment that uh, will help in clarifying a common set of guidelines and vocabulary for discussing the assessment process within our work group and across uh, this process. Um, we're going to take questions at the end of the presentation, um, but you can type in your questions as we go in the question box that you see um, on your screen. Um, this screen just sh the work that we're discussing today comes from two reports that were authored by a team of investigators that you see listed here. Um, I'm, I direct the UCLA Bourne Center. I'm also a physician in the VA, a geriatrician, um, and a senior natural scientist at Rand Health. Uh, Dr. Lassa Ray, who will be presenting as well today, um, is a nurse of primary health um, re services research fellow in the UCLA Department of Medicine. And in this project, we were joined by Kate Wilbur at USC and Bob Newcomer at UCSF, as well as Keisha Fulbright um, from our Boren Center. Our team wants to acknowledge the SCAM Foundation, who funded the research, um, in particular Lisa Sugarman, who provided significant guidance for the work. We had additional support from the Department of Veterans Affairs, the UCLA Boren Center, and the UCLA NURSA Fellowship Program. In addition, we benefited from the thoughtful input, comments, and guidance of leadership from the California Department of Healthcare Services, the California Department of Aging, and the California Department of Social Services. I have described, you know, in the last slide a great deal of support for our evaluation work. The motivation for this comes from the recognition that California is seeking state assistance with long-term services and supports encounter an often daunting array of fragmented and inadequately coordinated services. As Lori mentioned, the California Legislature and SB 1036 set out to address this by directing the Department of Healthcare Services, the Department of Social Services, and the Department of Aging to develop a universal assessment process, including a universal assessment tool to be used for home and community-based services. The long-term services and support programs whose intake processes would be affected by this mandate include the multi-purpose senior services program, the community-based adult services, and in-home supportive services. Our review of the literature and our experience uh, with uniform assessment tells us that this mandate holds great promise for improving home and community-based support. For individuals with support needs, a uniform assessment process offers many potential improvements in care and coordination. A well-designed assessment process and instrument can facilitate consistent and reliable identification of the individual's met and unmet needs for home and community-based services. This approach can also simplify application for and access to programs and supports. And a more uniform process and assessment can also promote decreased fragmentation and improvement in the services provided. This review also tells us that uniform assessment can also offer potential improvements in program planning and evaluation. It can be used to enhance information exchange and data sharing across counties and programs. It can, it can also allow the state and policymakers to better understand the population that's requesting long-term services and supports, as well as their unmet needs. In addition, a well-designed process can contribute to better monitoring of quality and health outcomes. As we consider these benefits, we also have to be careful in recognizing and addressing potential challenges. We all know from experience that change can be very costly and that it requires significant investment of time and resources in planning. California supports home and community-based services for a very large and diverse population. These served populations can have different goals and trajectories. This means that items um, 
that are in, that are person centered and can allow for individualized care planning need to be identified. In addition, this diversity makes it important to determine if the assessment approach is valid across population subgroups. A set of uniform items does not in and of itself guarantee reliability and fairness across assessments. To get there, we need to have clear and doable processes, clear assessment items, and ongoing training and monitoring of the performance of the items, both initially with um, the initial release of the, of the process as well as over time. At the same time, the laudable goal of a perfect instrument can be the enemy of a good but realistic approach. There can be a trade-off between what is comprehensible and what is feasible. Efforts to be comprehensive in either the number of items or in the length of a scale in order to accurately measure a construct must be balanced against the burden to the client and to the assessor. If we create something too short and just count pages, it can become just another form or a hurdle that doesn't have any clinical or practical relevance um, for um, anyone involved in the process. But if we create a process that is too long and specifies at a level of detail that removes space for critical thinking, it can become burdensome and not feasible. When developing um, processes and identifying items, there are multiple different constituencies that have significant investment in particular approaches. These can include item developers and vendors. In addition to the population search, programs need processes and items that allow them to fairly continue to provide services and meet needs without interruption. All of these groups can have particular items to which they are wedded or particular approaches that they value uh, more than other constituencies. In the move toward uniformity, it remains important to protect the individual voice. This means that we need to prioritize the identification and process and items that are going to be person-centered and allow individualized care planning to be identified. So I think as we move forward, we've been very cognizant of these challenges. Um, and we will continue to be um, as we move forward with developing and thinking about these processes and, and items. I've described a lot of opportunities and challenges. Unfortunately, California does not stand alone in its interest in uniform assessment. National programs in various states have explored and implemented uniform assessment. California and other states considering a transition can benefit from systematically reviewing the content and processes of these assessments and can learn from the successes and challenges that other efforts um, to implement uniform assessment. Our research team's purpose was therefore to conduct an analysis of promising practices that can serve as options for decision makers to consider in their efforts to develop a, uniform, a universal assessment for California's home and community-based services, and that would support a more integrated delivery system. We wanted this work to provide a framework to consider in transforming the LTSS system into one that organizes care around individual needs rather than just around existing program structure. To begin to meet this goal, we entered um, into the develop and developing a set of research objectives for an initial planning grant to jumpstart this process. Um, we're going to be discussing today uh, research work that's related to two of these objectives. I will discuss our work to identify existing recommendations for the content of uniform assessment focused on improving need identification as a step towards better care planning and resource allocation decisions. And then Dr. Ray will discuss some of the definitional work that was a fundamental step in examining and extracting from comparator states information about the effectiveness of UA systems, including their instruments, staffing, care planning, and program functioning. So why are we looking at external standards? Um, we know that this can help us provide a framework for a content comparison of the various state instruments that we'll also be talking about at our in-person meeting um, in um, November for organizing and guiding potential out items for California and for also getting sort of a reality check on what the scope, the potential scope of a, a uniform assessment instrument might be. So 
So how did we go about finding standards? Our goal initially was to identify three to four sets of external standards. So we started by searching in PubMed, Google's web search engine, the New York Academy of Medicine's Gray Literature Report. And Gray is sort of a term of art for literature that basically appears on the web that's not been peer-reviewed but has just been posted um, by various interested parties. We use search term variations and synonyms for home and community-based services, assessment, standards of care. Keywords included health, home health, home care assessment, home and community-based assessment, home care patient assessment, standards of care, external standards of assessment, HCBS assessment, long-term care assessment, uniform assessment, and universal assessment, as well as case management assessment standards. Through the search, we identified candidate news articles, peer-reviewed literature, gray literature, manuals, and policy briefs. We searched the references in these to identify any additional guidelines or recommendations that had been made by professional organizations or national consensus process. We excluded um, proprietary instruments that were not in the public domain. We also asked content experts to identify key entities that might have an interest in developing core sets of assessment items. Based on those searches, we obtained non-copyrighted instruments and guidelines from recognized entities whose objective was to provide assessment standards. Instead of the targeted three sets, we ended up with five. Um, and these represented the variety we determined necessary to portray an overarching external standard of assessment. Each of these come from uh, different professional constituencies and perspectives, and that's why we ended up with five, because we wanted to capture all of these different kinds of constituencies that looked at it from slightly different perspectives. The Balancing Incentive Program Manual, or BIP as it's known, was developed for CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, the BIP um, program was established as a provision in the Affordable Care Act. It describes the minimum topics that states would be expected to include to satisfy a program requirement for basic assessment. It is, its recommendations are not meant to be a comprehensive needs assessment. Rather, it provides more guidance on a minimum set of domains that should be addressed in order to accomplish the BIP program's expectations for developing, and I'm just going to um, read you a quote from the BIP manual, a core of standardized assessment instruments for determining eligibility for non-institutionally based long-term services and supports, which shall be used in a uniform manner throughout the state to determine the beneficiary's needs for training, support services, medical care, transportation, and other services, and develop an individual service plan to address such needs. Um, so in designing BIP, they really intended to provide the state significant latitude within the general guidelines of um, the BIP domain. The second that we identified was the Case Management Society of America's Standards of Practice for Case Management. They were initially published in 1995 and then revised in 2002 and 2010. These standards are created to recognize the role of case managers and to establish standards for accountability. The third was the National Association of Social Workers Standards for Social Work Practice. These standards for assessment um, provided a holistic view of assessment with the aim of improving client satisfaction and improving quality of care across the care continuum. NASW takes a broad perspective, and as they, I'm going to also read a quote from their manual, that on the range of physical, emotional, and environmental factors that have an effect on the well-being of individuals and communities. The fourth is the AMA and American Academy of Home Care Physicians Medical Management of Home Care Patient Guidelines that were created to assist in providing care in the home both acutely and chronically. The focus of this guideline is on developing a home care plan, including identify, identifying needed services to care for individuals in their home, coord care coordination activities. It is meant to provide some order to an informed and continuing relationship uh, with the individual and to help in navigating a vast array of potential services 
organizations, and different federal and state regulatory requirements. And finally, we looked at the PACE program, the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly um, at, at, in their manual. Although it's considered a, a service delivery body, we felt that it was unique as a partnership between an organization, state, and federal government. Uh, for our purposes, it served as a representation of two different government levels of thinking, as well as the service provider level of thinking. Um, its manual was, was designed by recognized ent entities such as the Department of Health and Human Services and CMS. Um, this is contrasted with some of the other standards that, that we looked at, such as NASW's uh, holistic view of assessment or the AMA, a American Academy of Health Home Physicians collaboration that place more emphasis on comprehensive medical assessment. So uh, we felt that looking at PACE would also be um, a helpful place to, um, to start. We recognize that looking at the different perspectives that these different um, guidelines uh, were bringing in, that it was very unlikely that they were going to employ identical language, grouping approaches, or labels. So we looked across the instruments to identify and group in broad domains, and then identify topics within domains. We focused on abstracting information about assessment elements at the level of the domain or general areas and then going from there down to topics or more specific um, areas. For this cross com comparison, which we intended to allow us an understanding of the potential scope of a standardized assessment, we did not abstract specific items used to measure a topic. We did retain all of these instruments um, and standards in a database um, for the state so that when they do choose to go back and look at items, they can avail themselves of that. But we felt that the initial discussion of what domains were important and what topics within those domains would be much clearer if we did not get down to the level um, of specific items at this point. So we classified uh, the recommendations for content into nine domains that you see listed here on the slide. Um, background, financial, health, function, cognitive, social, emotional, behavioral, goals and preferences, environment, caregiver, and others. And I'll go through each of these domains and the topics that have been grouped um, within them. So in background information, in the domain that we labeled background, we found multiple topics. These included communication, such as assistance required, ability to make oneself understood, and expression. Cultural history and influences. Demographics, such as marital status and race ethnicity. Education, formal services and providers health insurance, health literacy, uh, meaning the ability to both read and or understand health information that's presented either um, with prescriptions or in a clinical setting, um, legal representatives, documents, informal supports and systems, language issues, um, and again, um, talking about preferred language, language use in the home, um, other types of language barriers, others living in the home, primary caregiver, primary health care provider, residential status, and spiritual support. In the domain of financial assessment, um, common topics included employment history, income, assets, and other private resources, out-of-pocket expenses and impacts, and program eligibility. In the domain of health, there were multiple topics. Um, and these included abuse or neglect, potential for abuse or neglect, or a history of abuse or neglect, allergies, adverse drug events, assistive devices or adaptations, continence of both bladder and bowel, dental status, fluid intake, gait and balance assessments and falls, genetic history of family health, hearing, medical history um, including active diagnoses, Medications, um, medication list, medication counts, medication adherence um, patterns, as well as ability to understand um, medications, nutritional status and weight change, pain, physical exam, special treatments, swallowing, and vision. In functional assessment, 
Um, it was typically divided into the instrumental activities of daily living, or IADLs, and the basic activities of daily living, or ADLs. And the subdomain of IADLs, topics included equipment and supply management, managing finances, managing medications, meal preparation, ordinary housekeeping, shopping, telephone use, and transportation. In the subdomain of ADLs, topics included ambulating, bathing, bed mobility, dressing, eating, hygiene, mobility both within the home and outside of the home, oral care, toilet use, and transferring uh, within the bed or from bed to chair. Topics within um, cognitive, social, emotional, behavioral included alcohol or other substance use. Um, I should note in talking about this that um, in the soon-to-be-implemented ICD-10 codes, the mental health items that have been supported by the American Psychological Association distinguish even within this um, domain between addiction, abuse or binging, and health sequelae. Um, then there's also within this um, domain the topic of behavioral symptoms. Um, some prefer um, here for behavioral symptoms the label of unmet behavioral needs. Um, cognitive function, which um, included, depending on the standard that you were looking at, judgment and decision-making capacity um, and or memory. Mood and affect, other psychiatric conditions. Readiness to change or motivation recent changes in cognition or um, other evidence of possible delirium, sexual functioning and body image, social participation and isolation, um, and suicide risk. In the domain of goals and preferences, um, the topics addressed included advanced care planning or end-of-life um, decision-making, care goals, expectations, and preferences, so focus more on the day-to-day -day kinds of goals that an individual might have, health goals, expectations, and preferences, personal values or beliefs, and uh, transitional or discharge plans for individuals. And in the domain of environmental assessment of the home and community, um, it included adequate space, communication with emergency services and utilities, community resources, emergency preparedness, and housing accessibility. Environmental assessment also included the topics of housing stability, neighborhood safety, safety within the home, access to telephone and other communication devices, and access to transportation. Within the domain of caregiver assessment, topics um, that we found included availability to provide care, emotional competence and stability of the caregiver, history of abusive behaviors, hours um, devoted and tasks performed, physical capacity, stress or the need for respite services, willingness and ability to implement the care plan, and willingness and ability to work with the care team, which um, one set of standards distinguished between those two um, the difference between willing to cooperate or work with the care team versus the ability to actually implement um, the care plan. We created a domain other for topics that were not included in broader domains that were listed above. Many of these are interesting, I think, to consider um, for the more person-centered or individualized kinds of assessments, um, family dynamics, learning and technology capabilities, recreational and leisure pursuits, self-care capability um, as opposed to disability, and, and client an emphasis on client strengths, um, the stage in the life cycle and related developmental issues. Um, as you can see, for those of us that view home and community-based services as optimizing quality of life by meeting the needs of the individual in their community, there are a broad range of assessment topics. Our goal with this approach of going through and looking at the domains and the topics was to systematically provide a framework that would help facilitate discussions and comparisons as well as thinking about some of the trade-offs 
that I mentioned earlier between comprehensiveness um, and feasibility and burden. Um, the standards that we looked at varied widely in their scope, but for five domains, the majority of kind candidate topics were included in more than one set of, of, of um, recommendations. And these were the background and demographic information, financial assessment, the functional status items of ADLs and IADLs, the cognitive, emotional, and behavioral items, and some limited sets of goals and preferences. So arguably, you could say that given that these pop up in um, multiple external standards, that these assessment items could be seen as potentially core to any um, standard or uniform assessment. If reliable and valid feasible assessment items can be identified, then we should give those um, extra consideration for including um, in the standardized assessment. Four domains had a majority of topics that were included in recommendations by only a single organization. And these were the health domain, environmental assessment, the caregiver assessment, and the category of other, as you remember, that included family dynamic, recreation, leisure pursuit, self-care capability, and client strengths, stage in the life cycle, and related developmental issues. Um, and in health, um, a lot of the items really, um, although grouped under health, focus on function and, in, and, and needs of the individual. Um, so also not really mentioned even in these standards, uh, but I think are worth thinking about, um, were social roles of the, for the individual, engagement in the community or workplace. So in addition to these from the standards, we uh, might also want to consider um, these other types of topics. For those topics that are recommended by only one organization, stakeholders may want to consider these as prompts to really ask about the potential utility of including these for appropriately identifying need and for program level planning for persons requesting long-term services and support. So, you know, the, the, the question becomes, do we want these items on this standard assessment that's, that's done on everyone seeking um, uh, enrollment and services in these programs, or are these more things that would be done um, at the provider level um, in looking at the needs of individuals? Um, this, but I think this helps provide us with a framework for comparing the content of various um, instruments at later project stages. Um, so in later documents that you're going to see throughout um, that, that we've prepared for this project, you will see these domains and topics as basically the rows and tables. And then you will see in those same tables on the columns what other states or other, uh, what California programs in Dr. Wilbur's report um, actually whether they have items in those areas or not. And so it gives us just a way of trying to help organize these items. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ray to talk about um, the work that was done to begin to organize the various comparisons across states that builds on this initial um, domain and topic work but then also helps to develop a common vocabulary for looking at the assessment process. Awesome. Hi, this is Lassa Ray. I'm very pleased to present some of our work to you today, and I look forward to meeting some of you in Sacramento in November. In this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about a framework we developed that has been helpful to us and has allowed us to organize our thinking about the components of assessment processes. We have found this framework um, that, uh, helpful and it has provided us with a uniform vocabulary that has anchored us in our conversations as we have developed our understanding of existing practices in other states and in California and as we begin to consider options for the future. First, I wanted to provide a little context for the development of the framework. As Dem mentioned before, we undertook a study of the uniform assessment systems developed by four model states in order to learn more from successful models elsewhere. 
We will go into depth about the four state study and our findings at our next in-person meeting in November, but I wanted to introduce the work now at least because it is through that work that we developed the assessment framework that I'm going to talk to you about. The purpose of the, of the um, four state study was to support California's effort to create a universal assessment system by examining universal assessment instruments in use in other states to understand how states designed their assessment processes, and then to understand how their instruments work within the system of assessment steps and stages to accomplish various goals. And the general approach that we took for this project was that we reviewed program websites, we examined the waiver uh, documents and applications, as well as the universal assessment tools, and we interviewed key informants and program leads in the four states, which are listed here. Um, when I present this work in detail in November, we'll also talk about how it was that we came to select these states. And the, the study states were um, Washington, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New York. The assessment framework that we developed arose during the early stages of that project as we began to see that each state uses different terminology to describe their assessment processes. Um, before getting into the details of the framework, I wanted to talk here about how we developed it. So um, after early interviews and information gathering from the four states, we developed an initial framework to help guide our thinking. We then brought that initial framework to the core advisory group and our active academic partner team to get their expert input on the early version. We also looked at the literature and found one paper in particular that was quite useful, so I wanted to give credit to the Hilltop Institute, whose 2009 report contains a list of assessment steps that was useful in developing our framework. And then last, as we competed, completed information gathering from the four states, we referenced our findings against the framework and refined it as needed to ensure that the stages and uses we defined within the framework were consistent with practices. Um, currently in use by the state. So here are the components of the comprehensive assessment that we identified. Um, and uh, I'm going to keep coming back to this image as we move through the slides, so don't worry about trying to remember all these stages at this point. This, and I'm just going to sort of review all of them for you now. So the first stage um, is the preliminary screen. And this refers to the initial contact an applicant has with an assessor or a resource center that determines on a more superficial level if there's an appropriate match between the applicant and the services that are available. This might take the form of an informal conversation or they, there may be a formal preliminary screening assessment tool in use. In either case, the preliminary screen leads to a full assessment or may confer a spot on a waiting list. Um, and it determines, essentially determines who will go on to the full assessment process. The next uh, stage is the eligibility determination, and that consists of two steps. Um, the first is functional eligibility, which establishes that a nursing facility level of care criteria um, is met. Um, and for that reason, this stage is sometimes referred to as the level of care determination. And then financial eligibility is determined um, in cases where financial eligibility is linked to Medicaid eligibility, um, this financial eligibility determination is sometimes performed by Medicaid departments. The next stage is needs determination. And that means identification of specific service needs or gaps in a consumer's current network of services and support. This is followed by care planning. So care plan development refers to creating a plan of service delivery that takes into account an individual's needs and goals, their existing strengths and sources of support, and it identifies available resources that will be mobilized from a range of formal and informal services and support. This is followed by a service authorization stage. So this refers to the process of establishing a budget or allocating service hours. And there are a range of ways that we've seen this being accomplished. As I'll talk about further next week, some states' instruments have algorithms that automatically assign service hours or budgets. 
Others pull information from the needs assessment or the care plan that is then used by an individual or a team who consider the, the information gathered and come to a determination of service hours that will be authorized. The next stage is service coordination and case management. So this is where a specific staff member or team ensures that services are being provided and have been provided in a timely fashion and in a way that is consistent with the needs and goals of the consumer as well as the plan of care. Next uh, is the quality monitoring stage. And quality monitoring is an umbrella term that's used in different ways by different states, but it encompasses a range of activities, including um, audits of completed individuals assessments or audits of um, a, a um, combination of assessments conducted by a single assessor. Um, and it also can include performing analyses of aggregate data to evaluate quality metrics. And the last stage that I'm going to talk about is reassessment. So reassessment refers to repeated assessments that accomplish uh, one or more functions, such as um, to verify continued eligibility, either functional or financial eligibility, to verify effectiveness of the care plan, um, and to assess changing uh, consumer needs. And we've seen that reassessments are typically conducted annually, but sometimes as frequently as every quarter, um, and often they can be triggered when there's a change in status of the individual. So here again is the entire framework. Um, and we, of course, can make this available to, um, to the stakeholder group, if not the, the public in general, if, it, if it's not even made available to you. And, um, so just to summarize my comments, I, I wanted to uh, present this framework um, to underscore, underscore the fact that assessment is a multi-step process. Um, and because we have found that having a unified terminology has been efficient and has laid the groundwork for productive discussions of process components of universal assessment. And of course, we'll use this structure to evaluate our compar comparator states. Um, and it's, of course, our hope that this may also help guide our thinking about options for California. So um, I want to thank you for listening to this sort of foundational um, presentation today. Um, we, did, we elected to do this by webinar because um, we felt that covering this ground was really important to make sure we all had common vocabulary and constructs and then um, going into the discussion of the um, comparator states um, in, in subsequent meetings, as well as what priorities we were going to have for the instrument and the, the goals and, and um, the topics and domains. Um, I, we wanted to leave a fair amount of time for questions, um, if people had questions at this point. Um, and so I was going to ask Lori, um, who um, is facilitating the meeting, to um, help us with the um, Q&A um, part of this. Lori, if you don't mind. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Saliba and Dr. Ray. Um, on both counts, very informative and definitely goes to the core of what we're doing um, with the Universal Assessment Work Group. So thank you very much. Um, so at this time, uh, we would like to invite your questions and comments. And you may offer those uh, by typing them in. Once I see those come in, I'm going to take questions and comments from the stakeholder work group members first. And then time permitting, we can answer a few questions or comments from members of the public. But I'd like everyone to be invited and feel free to type in your question or comment at this time. While we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, I did want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded so that uh, by Monday, we will have posted online uh, both the recording of the slides as well as the audio overplay. And that's part of why we um, set up the call today so that we could have that available for anyone who either wanted to hear it again or who wasn't able to make it today. I will also take a moment to remind uh, our stakeholder work group members and others that we have our second 
work group meeting next week on November 7th at the California Department of Social Services in Sacramento. The announcement of that meeting has been posted on the department's website, and we will soon be posting materials there as well. So uh, we did have a question earlier that I'd like to uh, pose to our presenters. And the question was, um, how can we have a standardized or universal assessment when those being assessed come from all different cultures? I think that's a, it's a very good question. And I think that's one of the challenges in in identifying the um, cultural, the goals and preferences sections uh, within the instruments. I think first we have to start from an understanding that not everyone will have the same set of goals um, and preferences, and that therefore we have to ask and give people the opportunity to um, convey those um, convey those goals and preferences to us. And getting beyond just a discussion of end-of-life preferences to more um, daily kinds of preferences and supports. I think it's also um, a really big issue because depending on where people are in the life cycle, um, their, their goals and, and objectives may be very, very different um, in terms of engagement with the community and engagement um, in, in the workplace. Um, so the importance is in individualizing that sort of goals and care planning piece of this. Um, and um, some items in terms of descriptions, in terms of such as the functional status items, the instrumental activities of daily living, or the basic activities of daily living, um, the cultural um, is, are not as culturally grounded. Um, the ability to, um, to walk within your home or the ability to walk outside the home. On the other hand, even those, um, I've worked with investigators in Japan, for example, and some of our housekeeping items don't translate um, in, in Japan where they don't mop. They actually get down on the ground with a, a hand brush and scrub the floor. So you do have to allow some latitude in, in the way some of the questions are framed um, for different approaches that, that, that folks will have. Well, thank you very much. And we have another question from Marty Lynch. Marty is asking, health, would this include items such as diagnosis, like diabetes? Yes. Um, in the, um, the, there was, um, in, on the second health slide, I believe, there was um, a, an, a topic of um, diagnoses. And in some instruments, uh, particularly those that are derivative of the minimum data set, they focus on the term active diagnosis. Uh, which means um, sometimes diagnoses lists um, are self-perpetuating over time. Um, and what the active diagnosis label tries to um, do is say that it has to be currently affecting the health and, and health management of the individual. Um, so um, yes, if, if that is something that we decide to include, or the, the um, the de developers of the um, uniform assessment decide to include um, common conditions such as diabetes, um, heart disease, cancer um, would um, certainly be um, listed as diagnoses. Thank you, Dr. Saliba. Now we have a question from Gail Groner who is asking, to what extent do the four states operate programs similar to California's in-home supportive services or the IHSS program? Um, so that really is, is, the, is exactly the type of question that we um, address in, in, uh, in the, four, um, the four state comparison study. And I, I might actually defer the answer to our next meeting because that's when we're going to really go into depth um, into the programs that are um, currently exist in the four states and um, to a certain degree make a comparison to the IHSS program. Um, definitely all states have um, programs that are similar. Um, the, the other states tend to use um, 
waiver, pro waiver programs a little bit more than California, but they all have non-waiver programs as well. So, Gail, you asked a great question that sets LASA up for the uh, <laughs> November meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so we have a question from Terry Stanley who's asking, would it be possible to actually see the assessment tools? And Terry, I'm not sure if you're referring to the tools used by other states, or could you um, add some clarification to that? And we'll turn that to our presenters. Do you want to move to the next question yes. while we're waiting? Yes. Yes. Meanwhile, uh, Cordula Dick Mulkey has commented, cross-cultural issues are not just going to be important in item development, but also critical to the training. Yeah, Cordula, you're exactly, you're exactly right. I mean, this is, and as I said, I think one of the challenges for uniform assessment um, has been traditionally, you know, we like put those items out there, or we put those assessments out there, and then it's just sort of like they're supposed to just take care of themselves. Um, and the training in cultural competency in, you know, uh, conducting these assessments and, and really tailoring them to um, the individual uh, really has to be ongoing um, over time. I think it's very interesting, too, we find that as people do these assessments, um, they come up with new questions, um, you know, as they experience different kinds of situations and different kinds of patients and clients and consumers and caregivers um, and, and things that not, would not necessarily have been anticipated. So um, I think that's a really good um, point to emphasize, um, that this is not just a, a one-off um, event, but it's really an ongoing um, interactive process. Thank you. And Terry has followed up with uh, the question and, and clarified that, yes, uh, she would like to see the actual assessment tools used by the other four states. Do we have access to those? So um, a couple of states um, let us look at the tools, but they're not publicly available uh, for posting because they're um, electronic um, CADI computer-assisted um, completion systems, and they asked us not to post them. But those for which the states have given us permission to post, we certainly uh, will. Thank you. And I invite stakeholder workgroup members to continue entering your questions. Meanwhile, we will take a few questions um, and comments from the public. So we have a question from Joel Gers, and he's stating, if multiple agencies and disciplines will use a university assessment tool, won't clients experience duplication and repetitiveness, and won't a comprehensive tool then become too cumbersome and time-consuming to be practical? Um, I think, Joel, you raise a really important um, point for, um, and, and I think why the framework that LASA presented is so important, because I think what we have to think about in developing a uniform um, assessment process is how these, um, at what points that information is um, collected and used in common across different programs and at what point it becomes an added module that um, particular programs may ask additional items in order to um, tailor partic for particular programs or program needs. So the goal would be that there be this one core set of items that, er that the different programs would have access to. Um, and then um, as if different programs needed additional items for their program functions, they might be added as a module. So that's one approach that's available um, to think about um, to minimize the burden um, issue um, across the different um, instruments. But it would require a level of shared information sharing, um, IT and infrastructure in order to be able to do that. But that would certainly be um, one vision of how to minimize the burden um, for the um, consumer. Thank you so much for that. We have another question from Chris Mathias. And the question is, do you envision different service providers doing different parts of the assessment? For example, the health domain done by a health care provider, background done by a social worker, et cetera. 
Um, well, what we hope to do with this process is lay out the various steps and then work with the, um, the state programs and with the stakeholders to make that decision about who does what um, and, and how it's done and how it's sequenced. So the first step in making those decisions is to first lay out here are the different places where assessment is done, the different um, phases of assessment, the different elements of assessment, and then deciding um, which of those um, need to be done by whom and in what, um, in what order and um, in what um, manner. I think one of the things in Lassa's um, presentation that was um, really important was the pre-screen um, topic. And, um, and some, some recommendations put a fair amount of assessment at the pre-screening level in order to uh, make a determination early on about whether or not individuals should go through additional assessment steps or not. Others have that as a very cursory uh, level of, of screening um, and then do much more of the assessment in later stages. So that's just one example of um, a decision point that will be faced in designing this instrument. You know, wh how much do you want to, should be handled at the pre-screening phase uh, and how much is handled more downstream. And there are multiple uh, layers at which decisions are going to have to be made about priorities and trade-offs. And, you know, again, um, in answer to the question, um, uh, Chris, uh, that Chris raises, um, it could, you could imagine it could get to be fairly burdensome to have, you know, five or six different providers involved in one assessment. But we could also imagine that that assessment would probably be better if people that specialize in particular areas are doing the assessment items related to that area. So there would have to be a discussion of the pros and the cons and then an intentional decision made about the best way to go about um, creating a feasible and accurate um, assessment. Well, thank you so much for that. This is Lori, again, Lori Clark, again, your facilitator, and I just want to um, comment in that role that it's really uh, fortunate the, the way the work group process is set up and the fact that we have these tools and research generously provided by the support of the SCAN Foundation and the departments coming together because it really does, as you're saying, Dr. Saliba, create a basis for helping the stakeholders and others to have an informed discussion around what are the issues, what are the implications, and what are um, other types of experiences. We have time for one or two more comments. We have one uh, from Cordula Dick Mielke who's asking, I noticed in reviewing the material that only two of the assessments included items regarding elder abuse. While I agree with the approach of drilling down to the most frequent domains, I think we will also want to prioritize issues in that er that uh, are unaddressed currently in our assessments. Elder abuse is so underrecognized. I hope we also look at prioritizing in this way. Absolutely, Cordula. I think in my comments I said that, um, and I would like to reemphasize if that wasn't clear that, um, you know, by looking at frequency, um, really the intent is to say, look, if five of external standards all say that this topic or domain um, should be included, we really should give heavy weight to that. But that does not mean that we don't look at these other topics, that having these other topics um, uh, available to us and laid out in front of us allows us to really have the kind of discussion that you're mentioning about these items. And I even mentioned a couple of topics that I think weren't included in any of the standards, but that we might, might take a look at. So it is not meant to constrain, uh, rather to give us some sense of where the current map is. Um, in terms of recommendations um, and standards. Um, but if two instruments, um, you know, certainly elder abuse is one of the um, 
things that comes up when we visit folks in their home or we see people in the clinic um, or in the emergency room. Um, and it's a very important um, topic um, for us to talk about, um, whether it, uh, it belongs in this initial um, sort of needs assessment and then the manner in which it's queried um, when and if it's decided to be a topic and um, within, the, within the instrument. Well, thank you again for your comments and also uh, for the entire presentation. So Dr. Saliba, Dr. Ray, thank you very much for helping us to think about this important topic today. Uh, we are close to concluding the webinar for today in respect for everyone's time. I would like to point out once again that on the screen as you're viewing it, we have the website posted where you will find a recording of this webinar, both the PowerPoint slides and the audio portion uh, posted for your review or to be able to come back to. We had a question about whether the questions that were posed uh, during the webinar and the responses would also be posted. And I just need to look into the feasibility of that, but I, I feel strongly that we likely have the technology and would be able to do that. So we're happy to do that um, if it is possible to do. And so finally, I would like to thank everyone for your time on the call and once again to remind you that we will be having the second stakeholder work group. Uh, again, we will uh, have Dr. Ray with us who will follow up on the work of other states' experience and present on that. And the entire work group will begin to um, look at creating the framework for moving forward with the development of the tool and assessment. I would also like to say that for stakeholder work group members, um, we will have a discussion guide that will help to build a bridge between today's webinar and the work group meeting on the 7th. So if you could uh, look for that when the meeting materials come to you and take a few, a few moments just to reflect on that discussion. It's an optional piece, but I think it will help you um, to uh, come prepared to enter into a very robust discussion. So again, many thanks to everyone on the call and thanks to our presenters. We look forward to hearing from and seeing all of you soon. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>